Okay, so, excellent. So I'm going to just give a brief introduction to, to nanopore sequencing um, and then talk about some of the particular characteristics of nanopore sequencing that I think make it uh, unique and interesting. And then I'm going to be a bit indulgent um, and talk not about human genetics, but about uh, a case study that we were recently uh, involved in, continues to be involved in, which is uh, pathogen uh, outbreaks, uh, particularly with Ebola, and talking about portability. So. This is the Oxford uh, Nanopore Minion device. Um, I'm going to go into some details about its uh, capacity, and I'm really going to focus on this. Although there are other Nanopore platforms in development and have been announced, uh, this is really the only one you can get your hands on now uh, and start using. So can I just have a little show of hands in terms of who's actually got one of these or has used one of these? Okay, about like five of you maybe. Okay, have you heard of these things? Who's heard of them? Okay, okay, good. So you, you know that this is a, a USB connected uh, sequencer and it's, uh, it's, it's extremely portable. So I just wanna just clear up something about the nanopore for everyone, which is essentially how big is it, okay? So there's a lot of confusion in the literature and I, I guess we as kind of prolific nanopore authors have added to that confusion uh, by, by, by posting various things in manuscripts. So very early on we said uh, in, a, in a manuscript in bioinformatics that one of the first uh, Minion uh, uh, papers that the Minion was about the same length as an iPhone. And at the time that seemed very reasonable, it was kind of iPhone 4 I had at the time. But of course they keep changing the size of the iPhone, don't they? And now it's, it's kind of like about this big, the iPhone 6. So uh, it, it kind of, that, that comparison didn't scale very well. We haven't retracted that paper, but later on we said, look, it's no, it's no larger than a typical smartphone. Um, again, I'm not sure if that's gonna uh, stand up. John Urban did put in a paper that it's, it's, it fits in your pocket. I think that's a very good description. It certainly does fit in your pocket, and pockets don't seem to be changing size much. Um, but I did also see uh, from a guy called Mick Watson, if you're on social media, you might be aware of him. Uh, he put in his paper that it was the size of an office stapler. And I think that's just a ludicrous comparison because an office stapler really comes in, in lots of different formats. I've also seen uh, a description that it's the size of a ruler, specifically a four inch ruler. I think, well, if you're going to say that, you might as well just specify the dimensions and not say ruler, right? Okay, so I'm glad I, I just cleared that up with just a short meta-analysis. The important thing about the nanopore is quite small. How does it actually work in terms of sequencing? The basic concept is actually quite simple. Um, you have a, a, a pore, a nanopore, and, and typically uh, in academic literature, that's a, a bacterially derived biological pore, uh, something like alpha hemolysin. Uh, Mycobacterium megmatis porinae, CSGG from E. coli has been recently announced. Um, and they're also synthetic uh, um, um, nanopores, uh, such as using uh, graphene. Um, and the idea is essentially if you can get some DNA into that pore um, and you can have a, a, an ionic flux, you can have a, a ions drive, driven through that pore, usually for, through a, an ionic gradient from one, one compartment to another, and you can, you can detect that electrical current with something equivalent to a, a patch clamp amplifier. You can uh, detect changes in electrical current as DNA is uh, um, obstructing the pore. And so, so from, from Winston Timp uh, on the left is a, is a pore which is unoccluded by a molecule, and in the right you've got a pore with uh, DNA uh, sitting in it. And so the trick is to make that happen uh, in a way that you can actually use in your lab. One of the issues that you'd have if you're trying to do nanopore sequencing is that those DNA templates will go through the pore incredibly rapidly, you know, in a millionth of a second, uh, unless you can somehow control their movement. And so much of the academic nanopore work has been on trying to find a way of, of restricting the movement of, of, um, of that DNA so that it can go through slowly enough that it can be detected. And so that's done with what's called, in, in nanopore uh, term, the motor protein, which is probably some sort of DNA helicase. And that essentially, rather than being a motor that pushes it through the pore, it actually breaks it, it slows it down, and restricts how quickly the DNA goes through the pore. And that gives you the ability to read off uh, the signal. So from this kind of schematic, 
we've got the pore, we've got the motor protein there, and we've got the DNA, which is unwound, and a single uh, strand, um, um, a single stranded DNA, uh, a single molecule of single stranded DNA is, is actually what's occluding uh, the pore in uh, Oxford nanopore sequencing. The other trick is you can do this, they've been able to do this in the lab for, for 10 or 15 years, um, but you need to be able to do more than one uh, uh, read at a time. You want to be able to scale this up and turn it into a parallel process. So the Oxford Nanopore uh, platform has uh, 2,000 pores, up to 2,000 pores on its sequencing surface, surface and that's achieved by um, a, a customized flow cell surface, which is a bit like a bubble wand. And so essentially you've got 2,000 of those arranged in a grid and if you look at it under a microscope you've got this uh, serrated kind of edge which encourages the, the, the membrane to, to stay uh, in, in there and uh, uh, support a, a single individual nanopore. So you have 2,000 individual nanopores uh, in that array and that array is directly combined with uh, an application specific integrated circuit which is a computer chip which can uh, essentially function as that patch clamp amplifier uh, to, to detect electrical current. So what you end up with is a um, signal that looks a bit like this. On the y-axis you've got electrical current which is measured in picoamps and, and on the x-axis you've got time and in real time the software translates those kind of quite fuzzy uh, noisy signals into a linearized signal and these are called events or, or also called squiggles. We, we refer to them as squiggles. Um, to turn squiggles into bases that you can actually use for your analysis they need to be sent to a, um, a base caller and conventionally that's uh, online uh, and it, uh, the, the company provided base caller is called Metricore so it's to be uploaded to Metricore uh, before you can uh, align it to a reference genome. When this technology was introduced, one of the kind of exciting ideas that was presented at AGBT in, in 2012 was that you'd be able to just take a clinical sample and just dump it straight into a nanopore and start sequencing. Sadly, that's not the case. At the moment, you still need to make uh, a sequencing library, which is not actually dissimilar to sequencing libraries that you make on almost any other platform. Um, there is a, a big difference between this platform and short read platforms in that you want to encourage the longest possible reads you can, you can get, particularly if you're doing something like uh, de novo sequencing, as, as Evan alluded to. Um, and so when we fragment DNA in order to get enough ends to do the molecular biology, we try and fragment gently, so we tend to, to fragment to the point where we're only looking at uh, um, uh, fragments with, uh, that are fragmented to about a mean length of, of 8,000 bases and, and not longer. And in fact, there's a huge amount of control you have over that process in the lab. You can uh, use needle pipetting, you could use uh, pipin prep uh, to try and encourage much longer uh, fragments. And it is genuinely true that the length of the reads that come off the instrument is really limited by your ability to do that sample prep and also the physical constraints of having DNA in solution. And so if you do try and have very, very long DNA, hundreds of kilobases, they'll tend to shear and break as you pipette them uh, through the library preparation step. But there's no theoretical basis uh, for, 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 a, for a limit of, of read length. After you've, you've fragmented gently, you then uh, just do a typical uh, type of library prep in that you're doing end repair and DA tailing and you're putting adapters on. But these adapters are very special because uh, one of the adapters contains that motor protein that's essential for slowing the DNA through the pore. Uh, and you also ligate a hairpin, which means that you can read uh, the template and the complement strand uh, of each individual single molecule. And by combining the template and the complement strand, you get a higher accuracy read by combining the signal from both strands. There's also a cholesterol tether which allows the, the DNA molecule to be attracted to the membrane surface uh, uh, to encourage it to find a pore to start sequencing. Um, recently, there's been a new library prep kit. That takes about two hours. So there's been a new library prep kit which doesn't give you that hairpin. It doesn't give you 2D reads, but uh, it gives you just the 1D reads. But the advantage here is that uh, uh, the library preparation time takes between five and 10 minutes. And you can do that with very, very little lab equipment. In fact, we've done that in a hotel room uh, AEGBT um, um, last year, and you can do that with, with uh, essentially just pipettes. So, one of the issues, I guess, if you're a human geneticist, and I guess you, most of you, you guys are, is that you would like to, I guess, get whole human genomes. Currently, the minine yields are not 
uh, sufficient to get whole human genomes at high coverage in a single run. And this is from a, a recent com um, uh, analysis paper uh, where they showed um, kind of run level performance over about 20 different runs. And you can see that the, the, the top is the number of reads that you're getting and, and the middle is uh, the yield. And so the yields of the flow cells are quite variable, anything from about 100 megabases uh, and, and to the very best performing flow cell there, 2,000 megabases. So even with the very best type of run, you're still looking at less than 1x um, coverage of a human genome. Uh, accuracy is a, a movable feat. It, you know, it, it, we've gone through various different changes in the library preparation kits and the flow cells with Nanopore, and it just keeps changing. It's kind of a breakneck pace and, and very difficult to keep up with, with what's going on. But we've had um, four different pore types, R6, R7, R73, and now R9. And each time we've had a new pore, uh, the accuracy has improved. So thinking about 2D accuracy, it's gone from about 65% uh, accuracy to 75% to 80 to 85%. And as of the last couple of weeks, we're playing with the very latest pore. So this is data that we generated last week, which is R9, which is the first time that the company has said what kind of pore they're dealing with, specifically the CSGG pore from E. coli. And actually, we're starting to see quite impressive per read accuracy going up to about 92, 93%. And we're told by the inimitable Clive Brown that we must be doing something wrong, and actually it should be more like 95%. So clearly, they think that there is headroom in the system to go there. And in fact, we are seeing reads um, that are coming out, individual reads that are coming out at 98, 99% accuracy. Only a very few of them, but we are certainly seeing, uh, that's the first time we've seen those kind of uh, levels of per base accuracy. And, um, it should be clear from the description of nanopore sequencing that, that there's no effects on the read length on, on um, error quality, so quite different from uh, short read technologies where you're reading a clonal population of, of molecules and where you're suffering from issues of um, um, uh, the clones going out of phase due to, due to incomplete um, incorporation of mo molecules. You don't get that with nanopore sequencing. You're reading the natural strand, and so the signal is, is very uniform, so you get, a, you get the, the same lowish quality all through, all through the read. There's a, a, a big problem with using this uh, data for actually doing biology, which is essentially what we want to do, uh, and, and we're particularly interested in using it for pathogen tracing, where we want to make sure every base is, is correct, which is that if you take those base called reads from the base caller, and even if you get 50 or 100 or 200 X coverage, and you line it to a reference, and if you take a simple consensus of, of those bases, you still end up with um, uh, a relatively low accuracy uh, result. Uh, and that's particularly the case with, with um, de novo assembly. You can do de novo assembly just in the same way uh, that Evan described PATBO assembly with a similar protocol uh, for nanopore sequencing. But the, the end result, the consensus, um, it comes out at around 98.5%. So still a high uh, consensus error rate. So this is work really mainly done by Jared Simpson in, in Ontario that we've been, we've been collaborating with him. On, on trying to improve this. And so he's uh, come up with methods for trying to improve this consensus by reference back to that squiggle data, the event data that comes off. Um, so I won't go through the maths, but essentially, he's essentially describing the consensus problem as uh, uh, um, saying, you know, what sequences um, uh, maximize the probability of the raw event signal uh, that, that we're seeing. And so, it's a very simple algorithm. You take a, um, what you believe to be your consensus sequence from uh, the naive type of consensus where you just take all the base calls and you average them out, and then you make mutations iteratively. So you introduce SNPs, you introduce uh, insertions and deletions, and then you uh, apply your function to say, what is the probability um, of, of this sequence given, given, uh, given the events that, that, that we have? And then you essentially choose um, the highest probability uh, sequence. So you, and you just keep doing that until you can't, can't get any improvements. And Nanopore give you a poor model. They give you a, a description of how they think the DNA behaves in the pore. And so the way that's described is as a Gaussian, they essentially say for, for the, the 1,024 possible combinations of fivemas, what is the mean and what is the standard deviation uh, of, of that kama in the pore, which is built up 
using lots and lots of training data. So you have that information to guide you into making a consensus. So we need to make a model that, that really allows us to understand what's going on uh, in the system. And so this is a kind of naive model of the data. So you have this uh, sequence going through the pore, GCTA, CGATT. And we try and imagine what the current signal, adding in some noise, because we know there's noise in the system, um, adding in noise, we imagine what that would look like in an idealized way. So that's, that's the first event. And then as it goes through, one base at a time, we get another event, and another event, and another event, and another event. And you'll notice that, that the lengths of these events seem to be non-uniform. And you'll notice that the amount of noise associated with events uh, uh, tends, to, tends to be different. Um, so this is what the instrument's doing in real time. It's taking that noisy signal and it's giving you this set of linear events, so a mean and a current standard deviation and a duration. And that's what you have to work with when you're doing, uh, event, uh, when you're doing uh, consensus calling. So a very naive mod model would just assume that, that there are no missing or extra events in the system and there's a direct mapping between uh, the sequence uh, and events. But of course, you can see that that's, that's very unlikely to be the case. There's a lot of noise in the system. So for example, in this signal trace, which is a real signal trace, when you see that, that outlying uh, peak there, is that an event or is that just a bit of, of noise? And, and those are the kind of decisions that you have to make. Uh, likely, uh, likewise, with, with this here, is that a single event or is that two events with a slightly different mean um, and, and uh, representing two different bases? And you can see that, that by eye, that's a little bit hard to pick out. So the, the model that, that Jared came up with actually has to consider various different uh, issues, over-segmentation, uh, under-segmentation, and missed events. And so, you know, so... Uh, so over-segmentation, essentially, you're breaking up signal into multiple events when you should have one, and under-segmentation, you're joining together events uh, um, where, where there's actually only one. And so the, the model uh, uh, that he's devised uh, accounts for all of those possibilities. And then it's just a question of training that on some, on some test data where you know the sequence to set up all the probabilities. And what we find is that the probability of not observing an event is actually directly uh, a function of the difference between expected current. So that's kind of intuitive. So in this, event, in, this, in this situation, you can see clearly there are two events. There's a big difference in current. It goes from about 50 to, to 55 uh, picoamps, and so it's very easy to distinguish those two events. In that other situation, you can see uh, it, that that is two events, but the, the difference in the means is actually quite small. Uh, and so that's uh, um, um, shown uh, as in terms of, of the, what the model spits out in terms of the probability of a transition uh, relative, uh, related to, to the absolute difference in current. And what this means basically is that you can polish up an assembly or you can call variants and you can do a lot better than you would do with a naive approach by referring back to the event data. So this is on an E. coli assembly. What you get uh, is, is before, if you look at the, the five counts in the reference genome and you look at the five counts in our uh, de novo assembly, you can see that most of the time there's a very good relationship, but for certain camers, there, uh, it really has a problem. And after polishing, many of those camers get corrected, but you also end up with um, these outlying camers. And so those, those camers that are still problematic are essentially homopolymeric tracks, and homopolymeric tracks remain a big issue. So any home polymeric tract of six or more, because we now use a sigma model, uh, is still problematic for the system. Okay, so I introduced that because I wanted to mention methylation detection, which is not work that I've done, but I figured that would be something of interest to this audience. Um, and we noticed very early on that, that, that uh, if we compare E. coli that's uh, synthetic, i.e. it's been subject to PCR amplification, uh, versus uh, a natural E. coli, we see a difference uh, in, in, the, uh, in the mean accuracy. And we assumed that that was because there was something uh, in the natural DNA, methylation or base damage, that would be affecting the signal because all of the nanopore models are trained on synthetic data. So you get an improvement in base score, but it, is, it implies that there's some kind of missing or unmodeled signal in natural DNA. And academic groups have shown previously that nanopores, generally speaking, uh, can discriminate between uh, cytosine and, and, methyl, and 5 methyl methyl cytosine. 
And so the data sets that, that we generated in order to kind of test this, uh, we helped Jared generate um, um, a PCR amplified E. coli, which would remove the damage and MACE modifications. And Winston Timp's group um, enzymatically methylated genomic DNA uh, to, to force uh, methylcytosine um, at recognition sites. And then for testing data, take human genome sequence, uh, which is both uh, enzymatically methylated as a positive control, PCR amplified to remove all methylation as a negative control, and then natural G-DNA, which should be methylated to a greater or lesser extent. And so you then take that model and expand it to include uh, methylation. So instead of just having A, T, G, and C, you also add M. And uh, we, we try and align uh, sequences, um, and we try and uh, look at the difference in uh, signal between uh, um, when we know we've forced on methylation and uh, when there's no methylation. And you can see uh, for this particular KMA, a large difference in, in the means between the methylated um, and unmethylated uh, data sets. And so Jared said that you guys would go wild for this plot. I don't know if that's true. It's not my kind of thing. Um, but essentially what you can see is, is um, it, it, it does work when, when we have, um, when we have a, a completely methylated a human DNA uh, using a DNA methyl transfer, transferase, it reliably detects uh, um, um, these motifs. Uh, when we have the PCR material, we, we don't see them at all. And then we have the natural uh, DNA, we see a very good correlation with alumina bisulfite sequencing. So early suggestion that methylation on nanopore uh, detection is possible. And this is just correlation with, with bisulfite sequencing. Okay, so that's the, that's the sort of technical bit over, and I want to talk about a case study which I hope will be interesting. Uh, and this is what's been taking up uh, a lot of, of my group's time and my time for the last uh, year and a half, which was the Ebola outbreak. And I really just put this picture up uh, here um, um, because it's uh, from a, a personal hero, Bill Gates, tweeting our, uh, our, our work here. Um, and uh, uh, really, I'm going to talk about um, how we've used uh, the Oxford Nanopore Minion uh, to do Ebola sequencing um, in real time. So this came about really after looking at this editorial that was published in Nature by Pardee Sabeti at the Broad Institute where she pointed out uh, quite you know, startlingly the difference between the number of uh, Ebola sequences that are published in GenBank and the epidemic curve of the outbreak. So you'll be aware of this outbreak, everyone was aware of it, uh, um, uh, starting around Christmas time 2013 and in fact we're still having flare-ups to this date uh, and it's responsible for, for over 12,000 deaths and, and over 30,000 cases. And if we look at the epidemic curve in 2014 when it was at its peak, uh, we can see here that um, we've got around 7,000 cases um, in October and Pardee's pointed out in her editorial that in fact we've got very few uh, genome sequences from, from, from this outbreak. And at the time, you know, you say, well, that's expected, you know, in an outbreak situation, there's more important things to be doing than generating genome sequences, not an unreasonable point of view. But in fact, there were genome sequences being produced um, um, at this time, and, and uh, part of the problem was data sharing, data hoarding, waiting for, for publications um, um, to come out. Uh, and of course, there are significant logistical dif distance, uh, uh, problems with uh, trying to generate uh, Ebola genome sequences. For example, uh, um, it's very hard to get a logistics carrier to take a, a big package of Ebola-infected blood and send it to your laboratory, and not unreasonably. So DHL, FedEx wanted quite a lot of money to do that. And of course, there are significant ethical and, uh, um, uh, issues and logistical issues uh, with, with collecting those samples and shipping them uh, out to, to uh, other labs. And so clearly our, our idea was that uh, it would make more sense to move the sequencer uh, to the sample, move, move, it, move it into the heart of the epidemic rather than trying to uh, get samples out. So um, this is a bit of work that was recently published um, and um, uh, it really depended on uh, a PhD student in my lab, Josh Quick, who, 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 um, uh, who managed to get this set up uh, in Guinea uh, early in, in 2015. And there was, a, you know, there was a bit of discussion about whether it'd be better if uh, Josh went to Guinea and I stayed home or he stayed home, I went to Guinea. In the end, we both decided it was better that he went. Um, 
So uh, and uh, he 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 went to to, uh, to 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 Guinea, but before he could go, he had to figure out exactly what you'd need to do to make the MinIron uh, into a portable device that would uh, be uh, effective at sequencing uh, Ebola. So we, we'd already done some some practice on on some Ebola material that we'd uh, uh, um, got in collaboration with our local um, um, defence organisation uh, DSTL in Port and Down. Uh, and what he what he did is effectively is he tried to set up a, a portable laboratory that would have all of the equipment that he needed. So he kind of cleared down a bench in the lab, um, and he uh, um, uh, got all of the equipment in to, in order to, to, do, to do the protocol. And so this is what he ended up with, um, what we call our, our lab in a suitcase, a pretty simple setup with a thermocycler, cubit fluorometer, heat block, uh, laptops, and, and a minion, all in a hard-shelled case for protection. And then our, our cold chain chain reagents, uh, frozen and fresh with the with the minion flow cells um, and material and and things that we needed to do amplification. So that's the the lab in a suitcase all set up and ready to go uh, to Guinea. And so um, the hard case, all the stuff, pipettes, pipette tips, uh, the reagents in there, uh, the rucksack above is just full of his pants and socks. So kind of extraneous in my view. Um, and in fact, although everyone. It was going to, to, to Guinea to help uh, with Ebola. You know, the only reason anyone was going Air France to uh, um, to, 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 to go to, to Guinea at that time was to help with the, the Ebola uh, response. Despite that, Air France still charges an excess baggage fee to take this. So, so don't char don't fly Air France. Okay. So this unpacked is this material. Um, in Donker Hospital in Conakry, and so this is effectively one of the first sequencing centers that I've set up. Um, this is, I've set up about seven of these now. You can see there's not, not a great deal to it unpacked. And, and really notably, and this is one of the things I think is un underestimated about nanopore sequencing, within two days of Josh uh, arriving, and this is a picture of Josh and, and Mars Carroll who, who uh, set up, helped set this up, and Dr. Masuma starting the very first nanopore run. So within, within 48 hours, we're able to generate a library and generate Ebola sequencing data. And if you try and do that with a conventional sequencer, I'd be surprised if you, if you can get data off the instrument in less than a couple of weeks, if not months. So that, that's a kind of an impressive facet of, of, the, of the system. How, how it actually works, I guess this is of, of relevance to, to anyone planning an experiment on nanopore at the moment because essentially the sweet spot for it, I guess, in human genetics is to look at amplicons or panels or small numbers of genes because I said the output is not quite there for whole human genome sequencing. So if you're interested in doing cDNA uh, of human transcripts, you'd, you'd follow a very similar process to the one that we did. And we essentially had to choose between whether we would go for a targeted approach where we would um, uh, look at specifically for uh, pathogen cDNA by synthesizing, doing RT-PCR with gene-specific primers, or whether we would do a metagenomics approach where we essentially do random hexama uh, cDNA synthesis and, si and sequence everything. Uh, in, in the event, we decided that the safest and the most likely to work would be to use uh, gene-specific primers, so we essentially devised a tiling amplicon scheme in order to give us coverage of, of the 20 kb uh, Ebola genome. And um, what we found, and to our surprise, uh, was that when we tried to validate this uh, initially, we were using very old RNA that was stored, and it was difficult to get products more than about 500 bases uh, because this RNA had been sitting around in the freezer for 20 or 30 years. Um, what we found is when we were dealing with fresh material, actually it was, it was relatively trivial to be able to generate 2 kb amplicons, which means that we could tile across the genome in, in 10 or 11 uh, reactions and get good coverage of the genome. We did actually find it was possible to go longer, but we were dealing with samples with quite a varying amount of Ebola. And of course, the less Ebola there is, the more fragmentation, the less starting material is, the, the less likely you are to generate long products. So 2KB products seem like a sweet spot. So this is what kind of nanopore data looked like at the time. Um, and you can see you know, I think people were put off by the error rate in terms of, of its usability, uh, but you can see quite clearly that, that you've got um, um, mostly reference bases there in dark green. You have um, um, mutations as well. Most of that is noise, but the, the column of A's in the middle is a variant. So it is reasonably easy to distinguish variants from noise in the system if you're just trying to pull out a consensus genotype, um, which is what we want to do. Um, 
And what we have found is that, is that actually this is a real-time system. You don't have to just keep running it. The, the runtime is up to 48 hours, but you just can run it for as long as you need to generate the information you want. And in fact, different to most genome sequencing projects, we're trying to generate as little information or, or the smallest set of information that we need to get the job done because we have to upload all this information. So what we're finding is with 5,000 or 10,000 2KB reads, we're getting effective 200 to 400x coverage uh, of the genome. And uh, if we just take the two direction reads that pass the quality filter, the mismatch rate is pretty good around, you know, uh, uh, between 8 and 12%. Eight and um, and so what that means is in order to generate these few hundred X coverage of the genome, we actually only need to run the instrument for a short amount of time. The fastest about 15 minutes, but most of the time, uh, less than an hour generates uh, the, the viral coverage that we need uh, in order to, 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 to do consensus genotyping. And this really just shows there's quite a lot of variability in the system. Sometimes you get a flow cell that's very fast. Sometimes you get a flow cell that's, that's much slower. Uh, so essentially, if you can monitor the run in real time, you know exactly when, when, you're, uh, when you're ready to stop. And as I say, the, the internet connectivity was the biggest problem uh, other than electrical power supply for, for the thermocycler, not for the, la not for the Minine because it runs off the laptop battery, but the power cycler, the thermocycler, if it runs out of power overnight, then obviously you have to start again. Um, and so we would, had to experiment with lots of different wireless hotspots, satellite phones and uh, hotel Wi-Fi in order to, to, to get this data uploaded. It was a, the big bottleneck for this project. Uh, again, with Jared Simpson, we adapted the uh, consensus algorithm that I described earlier. We adapted that to, to become a, a, a SNP calling pipeline that would give us a, um, a log likelihood score of SNPs being present or absent. And uh, combined with the SIXMA model, we found that gave um, exceptionally good genotyping accuracy for SNPs. So when we compare with Illumina data from the, the same samples, we get absolutely identical genotypes uh, uh, between the Illumina data um, and uh, the Minine data, but only for SNPs. We don't consider indels. The big error mode that's remaining in consensus is um, homopolymeric tract issues resulting in indels, and, and we, we still can't fix those completely. So here's, um, this is sequencing lab four. I set up four, four genome sequencing centers last year, um, and I've got a few more coming this year. This is the one in Nongo. I mean, it's, I think the bro is probably pretty scared right now. Um, it looks good, right? So this is, this is uh, uh, the WHO's sponsored um, um, genome sequencing lab um, in order to generate genome sequencing information um, um, for the epidemic, which continues uh, um, um, to this day. Um, and so we've just got some, some arty shots of the, of the setup here. Uh, this is uh, Joseph, uh, um, um, who's one of the local Guinean scientists uh, who we trained up to use the, the nanopore. Uh, and uh, various volunteers went from the UK to, to provide this sequencing uh, facility to the WHO. And you can see this is from uh, Koya. This is genuinely sequencing in the field, okay? So the big opportunity here, and I think, you know, you have to use your imagination if you're only interested in human stuff, you wish I'd stop talking about pathogens. You have to think, you can do this on human stuff as well. And so, so the opportunity for the real-time sequencing is that you are taking a single flow cell for a single sample, and you're using it uh, until you get the answer. So imagine that applied to, to, to a human sample. In, in Ebola, this meant that we were able to produce genome sequences faster than in any other outbreak in terms of how quickly we could go from a blood sample from a patient to a, to a complete genome that we can report back. And I guess that's relevant for, for, for uh, human genetics as, as well in the clinic. And so what we have found is that the very fastest we, we achieved was a turnaround time of 18 hours from the patient being bled to reporting back a genome sequence. Um, and uh, in many cases, we can do that within 48 hours. And in about half of cases, we can do that within a week. And that's, the, you know, that's slowed down not by how quickly the lab works, but how quickly you can get the samples across Guinea, which is a, a big country with quite poor transport infrastructure. And so we're able to provide real-time reporting to epidemiologists in this outbreak um, for the first time. Of course, I'm sure this is a theme in, in your community as well as ours, there's no point generating this information without real-time data sharing. You know, you can't interpret these genome sequences without context. And so one of the nicest things, one of the best things that came out of this project from, from my point of view as a biopentician was um, this website by Trevor Bedford and Richard Nayer, 
uh, ebola.next strain.org, where we could provide our genome sequences as we, as we generated them. Um, um, we sent them to WHO first so that they could uh, look at them and work out what the public health significance was. Once we got the approval, we put them straight online on GitHub initially, and then pulled down and went into this tree builder. And this is a lovely website, interactive website, and just gives you an amazing picture of how Ebola has evolved and spread over about two years. So this outbreak actually started in Guinea. Um, so this is Guinea in green, blue is Sierra Leone, red is Liberia. It started uh, in the forested region of Guinea, um, um, and you can see it started close to the intersection of, uh, of Sierra Leone and Liberia, which is partly why this, uh, this epidemic moved so much faster uh, and spread more quickly uh, than, 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 pr than, previous, um, than previous Ebola, which has mainly been confined to, to Central Africa. And what you can see is Ebola mutates, you're like this in terms of human genetics, Ebola mutates at two SNPs uh, every month. Okay, so what that means is over two years, this is the amount of diversity that's generated uh, um, in our cases. And you can see very clearly there's a very strong geographical signal associated with these genome sequences, the you know, Liberian clade very much uh, um, in, in the center there. Various different lineages associated with Sierra Leone and Guinea. Uh, and our results very quickly showed that we were dealing with two major lineages uh, uh, in Guinea, uh, here and here. Um, and the, the important thing about that is it allows you to very rapidly give epidemiological information that, that is, is unrefutable. So if you have a case um, that comes out in this lineage, SL3, and the epidemiologists hypothesize that they caught that case from a case that actually had this lineage, you can actually say with certainty that that's not the case, that, that, that those cases are unlinked. It gets a bit trickier when the, when the cases are very close together. You can't necessarily use the genome data to say, a, a gave it to B, it gave it to C, but you can very quickly either uh, refute a hypothesis uh, and rule out other um, 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 ideas. So, for example, over the last six months, the epidemic was very nearly declared over several times, and we've had various flare-ups, um, and uh, most recently in, in March. And when you get a flare-up, there's always a question about uh, whether those cases are New cases, um, you know, could they be a new spillover, a new introduction from an animal population? Uh, could they, in fact, be um, um, a, a chain of transmission that's been ongoing that, that the epidemiologists didn't know about? Or is there a link to a previous case? And in all the cases of the flare-ups recently, we've been able to, to actually pinpoint with just the genomic data, uh, the individual survivor, uh, they're always linked to survivors that have been carrying Ebola for, for, one or for, for up, to, up to a year and a half, and we'll be able to pinpoint um, um, these, trans, these, tr these new cases to, old, to older cases using this tree. So that was a, a, a really exciting project that, that I think is a model for pathogen surveillance going forward. And to make this happen, make this easier, we need to, to reduce the footprint and we need to reduce the complexity of doing it. So we're really focusing now on how we can uh, make this process. You know, we've got a very, very small, very portable sequencer that's battery powered. We now need to miniaturize and sort out all the rest of the lab stuff and the bioinformatics so that it can, it can be as reactive as the sequencer. So one thing I'm quite excited about uh, is this bento lamp, which is a, a you know, portable PCR thermocycler centrifusion gel box. Uh, it's a bit like a Fisher-Price toy if you have those. Uh, about 500 pounds Kickstarter project, various other uh, uh, PCR thermocyclers, portable ones becoming available. Um, we want to really get rid of this cold chain, get rid of these frozen reagents, move to dehydrated reagents, so we're looking at isothermal amplification. Um, read and till is something that's interesting about nanopore I haven't talked about, but it's the ability to selectively enrich sequences by rejecting uh, reads from the pore. And I mentioned the 1D library prep that can get the sample prep time down to, to five or 10 minutes. Recently, uh, there's been a case study showing direct sequencing of, of RNA, cDNA duplexes um, on the nanopore, meaning that you may not need to have amplification at all if you have enough starting material. And uh, Jared Simpson's recently built an offline base cooler that obviates the need for Metricore on the cloud. So what next? We're going to do this again. Um, it starts next week. We're off to Brazil um, with our Zebra project. This is called Zika in Brazil Real-Time Analysis. This is a road trip. It, it's a bit like Top Gear, but with more sequencing. Um, and this, the new thing is Lab in a Caravan. It's a fully kitted out CL3 lab 
in a caravan, in a trailer, which can be ported by a Jeep, with the sequences, the RT-PCR, QPCR, all the stuff you need to do sequencing on the road. And so hopefully this is something we can keep, continue to miniaturize, and it's something you can imagine in, in your general practitioner's um, clinic or in a hospital uh, very soon. So too many acknowledgements uh, uh, to mention by name, but particular thanks to Josh Crick and, and Jared Simpson. And uh, uh, I hope that was interesting, and thanks for your time. Thank you very, very much, Nick, for a very impressive talk. Let's look again at the Twitter there are chair. No talks. Mm -hmm. There are no questions. No questions. <laughs> no no questions. Time, but many Twitters, I'm sure. Twitters. I'm sure they've asked them already. All right. <laughs> Are there questions from the floor? I have a, a short question to start off with. So you mentioned that the, uh, the homopolymer, Nick, yeah. Yeah, the homo homopolymer problem in the, for calling indels is, is a big issue. So how do you see that developing in the coming years? So the, the, the bit of, there's two things. There's two bits of unmodeled information. One is the dwell time. Um, and we were told that the dwell time is the amount of time that, it, it, that each event is, is in the pore for. And essentially the dwell time was thought to be quite uninformative in early versions of nanopore sequencing because the enzyme is so starved of energy that um, it's, 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 that the process of movement is, is very, uh, it's just, is really dependent on, on how quickly an ATP uh, arrives uh, in the enzyme and it can move forward. Um, with the newer version of the chemistry, it's gone to, from 30 bases a second to 250 bases a second. So the enzyme's much happier. And so what we're, what we're expecting is those dwell times become more informative in terms of, of, of the length of the homopolymer, and we can use that. But no one so far has developed a computational model that incorporates the dwell time. The other thing is to think about is what's, in the en, uh, what's actually in the motor at the time. So we need a model that, in, that actually understands what the motif is in the motor, because that's about 15 bases away from what's in the pore, and you need some kind of conditionality between what's in, in the motor and what's in, and what's in the pore, and so that implies a slightly different model to the HMM that we've got. But I think it will happen. 